Thanks a lot, Aaron. Um, once again, um, my name is Andy Everson, and um, I have the fortune of, of being a descendant of George Hunt, as I, as I mentioned, and um, I also um, had the fortune of, of spending a lot of time with my grandmother, uh, his, his granddaughter, uh, in Comox and learning a lot from her firsthand about her grandfather and about uh, the kind of guy he was. And so the, the talk that I'm going to give today is called A Book of Treasures. And, and once again, alluding to this idea of the story box, um, for, our, for our people, um, we have what we call boxes of treasures. And we have these physical Bentwood boxes or chests in this case that store our ceremonial regalia and they're very important to us because they 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 physically house our, our regalia but also metaphorically house our regalia and our songs and our dances as well and so it's that metaphor of of the uh, storage box for our families that's really important and what um, in in our culture amongst the Kwakwakwa, uh, each chief has its own has his own unique box of treasures, a unique fingerprint that he can draw upon to show his ancestry, his lineage. Uh, he shares his dances and his songs so that people know where he comes from. He provides those songs and those dances for the people in his community, for his family members, so that they'll have a place in our societies. So they'll have dances that belong to them, but ultimately they belong in this collective box of treasures. And for us, when we're looking at, at uh, the work of, of George Hunt and Franz Boas, we see this as a, as a book of treasures. This is something that's that helps fill some of the voids of in the records um, that have been left over the years that um, are being used to the present day. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today, primarily is about how we're using these texts um, in order to, um, to show uh, these, these prerogatives. So going back to some of these these early um, these are early photographs, um, my grandmother's mother is right here. That's Emily Hunt. That was George Hunt's eldest daughter, and you can see George Hunt at the top and Franz Boas, George Hunt's mother Annie Salaga, and other members and his wife Lucy, and um, also Kareen's. Uh, grandfather there, um, Jonathan. Uh, so it's really showing this kind of um, this this family connection. You can see here's another old Hunt um, family photograph, and this is my grandmother right here, little Maggie, <laughs> and then once again Kareen's grandfather right there, and. It's, you know, it, it fills me with joy that, you know, we're able to represent our, our grandparents here today um, and providing their voice um, to all, in front of all of you. This is a little later on, and this represents a time after the potlatch law was dropped from the Indian Act. Uh, this is in the 1950s in Comox. Uh, my grandfather, Chief Andy Frank, over here, and my grandmother and my mother over there, and Mungo Martin, um, Tommy Hunt, David Hunt's eldest son, or son, and and other ones, uh, Dan Cranmer, or I think Dan's, in the, oh, Dan Cranmer right here, uh, who also worked with Franz Boas. And for us, uh, the period of, uh, of the potlatch law, as um, some of you, heard a little bit when we were up at the exhibit earlier, um, the, the potlatch law, anti-potlatch law in Canada uh, was in place for about 67 years. 
that it, it was illegal for our people to potlatch. And as Aaron mentioned before, it was the entire time that, that Franz Boas did his work amongst our people, that, he, uh, that collaboration with George Hunt was under this anti-potlatch law where it was illegal for our people to potlatch. And some of our, our, of our chiefs and noble women went to prison because they potlatched. And after the potlatch law was, was dropped from the Indian Act, there were certain families that continued to potlatch, that continued to potlatch throughout that ban. And these are representatives of some of those families um, during the 1950s. Um, during the, the anti-potlatch law, um, many changes happened amongst our systems, our potlatch systems. And in some cases, uh, people that were, um, were arrested uh, um, wanted to give up their, their rights in the potlatch system, and other ones wanted to hold on to it. And, and so there were many things that happened. Um, this particular uh, photograph uh, is, uh, is in, our, in our big house in Comox. This is my mum dancing. And I'm right in front of her in a little yellow shirt on my dad's, <laughs> my dad's lap. This is 1974. And um, so I, I've been going to potlatches all my life. And, you know, obviously never um, was around for the anti-potlatch law. But I certainly felt the effects because um, uh, I, I, as I got older and older, I became more and more interested in our, in our cultural systems and would spend hours and hours with my grandmother at her dining room table learning from her firsthand about her experiences with uh, Franz Boas and Edward Curtis. And it was in um, the eighth grade that I, I got this book out of the library and it's, a, it's a, my first chance of reading um, some Boas text. And um, one thing that really, really struck me was a lot of it I didn't recognize. I didn't recognize all the ceremonies that were happening because some of those ceremonies were no longer happening in our community. But I, I was so excited about the possibilities of, of being able to bring some of those back someday. And so I, I decided that in, in grade eight to pursue anthropology. Um, not many <laughs> eighth graders want to go into anthropology, but I was one of them. And my, my grandmother was um, particularly impressed because she says, I want you to be just like Dr. Boaz. <laughs> and so, um, so then it, it began my kind of um, interest in that, in that field. And um, one of the things that, as, as I was going through university, I started to realize that a lot of our, a lot of Boazian texts weren't being accessed fully in, in our, potlatch systems. And it wasn't until 15 years ago or so that, that we started to really bring some of these texts um, back out and start to utilize them in our communities. And for a number of different reasons, um, in some cases, families were finding long held uh, potlatch ledgers uh, where we listed all of our names. And increasingly in our communities, we started to have people that were going off to universities and learning about these texts and being able to access them in ways that hadn't been possible before and compare some of these texts with, with some of the ledgers and start to figure out uh, who owns what and, and so on. And so um, I'd like to talk about a, a few, uh, four different examples of the ways in which we use um, some of the Boazian texts um, in, in the contemporary potlatch system. The, the first one um, is this story of Umachtalatle. And uh, 
I first heard this story on an audio uh, recording. Uh, my, my grandfather, fortunate for us, we had the foresight of buying a, a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in the 1950s. And he would spend countless hours with Mungo Martin and Tom Umkhid and other chiefs from our, from our villages and recording stories and songs and narratives. And one of these, one of these tapes that we have uh, was talking about um, our, my great grandfather, um, Chief uh, Charlie Wilson, uh, my grandmother's father, and talking about um, this character, Umak Dalatle, and his father, Numuquis. And, and I, I'm not a fluent Kwapwala speaker, and so I'm getting my mom to translate all of this because, of course, it is all in Kwapwala. And then she starts talking about clubbing seals and all these kind of vague references. And I had no idea what they were talking about. I, and I did, what was really interesting about that audio recording was it was hard to tell if they were talking about the present day or if they were talking about the beginning of time. And because our, our names um, passed through all the generations and so people that hold the names back then um, hold names now, and so it, it gets very confusing. And so one of the exciting things for me was was finding references to Umach Dalatle and the stories uh, in the in this volume. But interestingly, the story of Umach Dalatle is probably the most um, widely told single narrative in all of the Boazian texts. There's at least five different versions of the story. And so I was able to go through um, all of these, the published texts where it appears, but also finding through the um, corrections in, in the 1930s that George Hunt um, made to this volume and, and other um, oral narratives that were recorded by my great aunt, uh, Helen Knox and so on uh, about Umach Dalatlai. And so I was able to create uh, a narrative uh, that combines certain elements from all of these tellings of the story to create a kind of a cohesive version that contemporary um, people could understand. And we were able to um, bring it out in a feast last year. And I, I, I stood in front, just as I am now, uh, stood in front of our people and started telling these stories. And afterwards, um, the, the old people came up to me and they said, that's exactly the way it used to be. Our, our feasts and potlatches were so grounded in these, in these traditional stories, these legends, and everything that we have is based on these. And in the story of Umak Dalatle, um, he goes off and he marries um, this high-ranking noblewoman from Kinkham Inlet, and he brings back um, a dance, this great wolf dance, the Walasaha, and he becomes um, a great seal hunter, and and so for our for our feast, I, I created this uh, dance screen, and this um, essentially encapsulates. Um, many elements of the of this legend of Umach Dalatle. And and so we um, with this story it, it leads us into the Walasaha. And for us, um, I, I remember the first time hearing about the Walasaha as well because uh, William Wazden Jr. was saying that that dance is owned by your family. And I said, what? <laughs> I've never seen this I've never seen this dance before. And so I, I started to look more and more into this. And he was telling me about this, this picture that was in the 1897 volume about the Wallasach. So I went and went and took a look. And sure enough, once again, this, this famous <laughs> painting. <laughs> um, but it, it stirred the imagination because um, in truth, um, this, this dance was given to Umach Dalatle and meant to be passed down through the Gigalgum of the Wallace Kwagir, our, our Namima, our clan of the Kwagir. 
the Wallace Pogge's people. And uh, this hadn't been performed in probably a hundred years. It hadn't been performed since um, during the time of the potlatch ban. And so we wanted to bring this out at our potlatch in 2013. And so we um, started to, to look into this, this narrative and, and description. And I'm gonna just briefly read a little passage from this book. And um, it says, the Walasaka is a peculiar wolf stance. It belongs to the legend of Umacht Alatlai, who obtained it by marrying the daughter of Kawadilikliya. The Walasaka is danced in the following way. All the men of the tribe dress in blankets and headdresses representing the wolf. They hide behind a curtain which stretches across the rear of the house. And when the singers open their song, come forth from the right-hand entrance of the curtain. These, their two criers are stationed who hold staffs and announce their arrival. As soon as a dancer appears, he turns and proceeds on a march around the fire. The fists are held forward and the thumbs are erect. And so we took this, and the, the description goes on a little further, but we took this description in order to um, recreate this dance. And, and we recreated it in a way that we, we have a number of different wolf dances amongst our people. And, and um, so we took elements of, of those wolf dances and, and combined it with the descriptions in, in this volume. And we were able to um, bring out the Walasaka again, for the first time in, in probably a hundred years. I got my nephew, uh, who has the name Carver, um, to learn how to carve. Um, this was his first carving project and he ended up making 23 wolf masks. Because this wolf dance is, is called the Great Wolf Dance for a reason. Um, it's, it typically shows between 40 and 100 wolf uh, masks at once. And so we needed to recreate um, a lot of these um, these masks for use in the ceremony. And so we we actually used the descriptions in this volume to to create the uh, particular style of of wolf headdress that you see there. Uh, we managed to get just over thirty, I think. Our big house isn't that big, so I don't know how they would have fit more than that. <laughs> in an old big house, but, um, but yeah, it, it was a very um, successful um, reintroduction of a dance. And in fact, what's really interesting about it is that a number of families from Kinkham Inlet have since asked us to use our wolf headdresses so that they could start doing the Walasaha again, where the dance originated um, at the beginning of time. Another um, example is uh, the Nuthlamatla, and the Nuthlamatla is a Fool's Dance Society. In this particular photograph, as we saw before as well, um, depicts a number of um, Nuthlamatla dancers and a Hamatza. Um, this particular gentleman is my great-grandfather, Charlie Wilson, and beside him is, is Mungo Martin. Um, and they're they're both members of this dance society and the role of this society is to kind of be policemen in our potlatch system and so they carry knives and lances and throw rocks at people um and so um we realized that we have this we had this um position in our in our in our family and so looking again through the text was able to find um, the neutral name from the Giggle Gum of the Wallace Quagyu, his name was Waskumlis, and um, and were, was able to determine that that was the the name of my great grandfather. And so we we wanted to bring this back, and and part of the initiation process that hasn't been done in a long time is that a a older neutral dancer goes around the floor. And then he finds the young initiate and puts snot on his face. <laughs> and this particular young man is, is my son. <laughs> and so he, uh, he's a very shy little guy. <laughs> um, but he got covered in some snot. 
and um, was initiated into the Nusramatla Dance Society. And you can see there he um, he was painted um, in one of the face paints of the Nusramatla dancers, where half of the face is is um, is covered with charcoal, and he goes around and throws snot on people. <laughs> but again, going back to this this photograph, we wanted to bring back. Um, sell some elements of his face paint. And so looking at this, um, we we're able to um, uh, bring some of that back and, and, and paint him up um, in the style of, of the Nusramatlas of Fort Rupert. And um, this, this, there's so many different connections and, you know, talking about the, um, the possible Nusramatla masks that are, that are upstairs in the, at the exhibit. And, um, and the style of, of face paint um, having parallels. And then working with Reiner, um, he's able to introduce me to um, wax cylinder re recordings. And, um, and then we found there's the song of Waskomlis. So that, and it's actually, I believe it was Charlie Wilson, my great grandfather singing the song on the wax cylinder recording. So we were able to listen to it and we found the lyric sheet for it. I worked with Chief William Wasden Jr. and we re-recorded a, a version of the song um, and tried to recompile it so that it kind of makes sense in our understanding of the way that songs work. I'm just gonna finish up with a, a little talk. I just literally added this during our break earlier. Um, <laughs> Just because I, I saw that it was, you know, it's a prominent part of the of the exhibit um, down the road. And um, the Hamatsa is a dance society that I was initiated into. And it's the Cannibal Dance Society. And I, I threw this this particular one in because it, it did influence us in our in our potlatch and looking at these these old um, you know these diorama sets uh, where the Hamats are the is in a wild state and he's coming through what we call a Maui, this um, si uh, sacred dance room. The whole um, and in many ways it's like he's being reborn um, through this um, through this hole. And so we wanted to take some elements of that. And um, so you can see this is um, pictures of my my initiation. I'm down there on the on the right, and my sister uh, acts as my heligiste, uh, carrying a corpse in front of me, and um, we're all covered in hemlock because when you go out in the woods, and if you want to find um, the spirit that you're searching for, you don't want to smell like a human. You want to smell like um, like the forest. So you use hemlock to purify yourself to do that. And then drawing on the on on this imagery, I literally took this picture earlier today from the. <laughs> it was a nice clear um, version of it. Um, I I created a, a Maui um, in Comox and what went through that that same um, same hole in this cream. Hey? <laughs> and my uncle Stan and yeah, a whole bunch of different family members and. Um, so that's um, just to conclude. Um, for us, we don't feel that the the Hunt Boaz texts are are crucial or critical for the continuation of our culture. Um, we would be continuing to potlatch and and doing what we do and have always done, uh, with or without these volumes. But really, these these enhance. Um, the dances that we've learned from our ancestors, from our um, from our forefathers, and 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 so I ju I just wanted to conclude with that, and um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer. Okay. Time for a couple questions. Um, in the United States, what became the United States? The estimates are that there were eight million indigenous people before the Europeans came. And when the Europeans were finished, there were something like 300,000 Indians left. 
Is that similar to what happened in Canada? Was it better or worse? Uh, yeah, it'd be similar. Um, like any um, indigenous population in North America, we were hit by wave after wave of, of diseases <coughs> and um, other things that happened amongst our people, but um, our, the depopulation was massive in our, in our communities. Uh, for instance, one of the things that I, I sometimes bring up is Judith sent me a, a listing of all the potlatch seats in Fort Rupert, and there's over 800 potlatch seats. In, in Fort Rupert alone in one village and at different points in history there are, you know there's only 100 people left yeah. so and these are just for the highest ranking people in the communities so um, you can imagine the populations could be significantly larger yeah. uh, thank you very much for the, for the presentation I have a question about the dioramas uh, that interest me. Um, in the 1990s, they have been criticized quite harshly for being racist or stereotypical and often dismantled. But you seem to have another take on them, mm -hmm. so you'll find them as a resource. Uh, could you just tell a little bit more? Because I, I found the, the, the shift interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, think, I, I think that um, the dioramas that, that Boaz kind of orchestrated, um, they are fairly accurate to what was happening. There might, you know, some of the positioning of, of the characters and it might be a little skewed and depending on what the big house looked like, like at the time, but the way that they painted their faces, all those things, like it's all pretty accurate, so. Two more quick questions, Barbara and then in the back. Um, I have a question about the other day in the wolf dance, it's not this wolf dance, but yeah. different wolf dance, uh, there were women dancing, yeah. and there were women dancing through the whole presentation. Yeah. <coughs> Has that changed? Because the book describes men. Yeah, so the Walasaka is, is a prerogative of uh, male dancers. So, um, the blue Wallace is, uh, is often done by women now. So it's a different wolf dance. It's a different dance? Yeah, yeah. 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 It's very similar. It's, the Walasaka is just <coughs> a lot longer and... Um, and it's, it's done, it is done by men. One more question. You spoke of figures policing during the, the ceremony. Mm -hmm. What are they policing? What are they policing? Bad behavior. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, anybody, because our, our um, tech, our winter ceremonials are such a sacred time for our people that they're kind of the, they kind of help make sure that those, the sacredness of the ceremonies are, uh, upheld, but what's ironic about the the um, dancers is that they break all the rules themselves. So they go backwards and they do all these things. They throw <coughs> snot on people and whatever. Um, so they're allowed to break the rules and and but they they make sure that they're upheld. Thanks. We're going to have to move on to our next um, speakers, but we'll come back and talk more.